And we're skipping item 13 and we are at item 14, which is the investment policy statement, the pension two first reading. Chris, do we have Ed in the room? Yeah, I think Ed is upstairs <laughs> All right. and probably on his way down. I gave him the heads up on the... I can start out a little bit. All right, or do you want to wait for him? Well, like we would. I think the idea was to time it so that we could do this item, yeah. so that you know our, our members in the back could participate, and then depending on the time frame, we'll kind of end with this item. Okay. We'll take a break, let let folks go off to client advisory, and then come back and finish our agenda. That was the vision. We'll see how it uh, plays out. Very good. So why don't you go ahead and get started, Chris, and then Ed can join us okay. as he. Uh, this is uh, an item that was uh, referred over from the retirement board uh, at the July meeting. Uh, Ed and the team did a presentation on pension two, and there was a discussion about the investment policy, and it was referred to the investment committee um, to look at and adopt uh, a pension two investment policy. So for those that have gone through your briefing, um, pension two is the defined contribution, here's Ed, the defined contribution side of the um, assets. Um, what we have done administratively is divided up the duties. Ed is responsible for the administration uh, of the pension two assets, and I'm responsible for the investment options of the pension two assets. We work together to draft this investment policy. Um, it's prepared for a first reading, but it's also in your power if you so choose to adopt it. Um, Today, uh, there are some investment option changes they're recommending, so the staff is eager to, to be able to move when you're prepared. Um, the big part of the uh, structure here to help you is that your responsibility, we sat down with the Groom Law Group and really tapped into their thoughts about your responsibility in a DC plan versus a DB plan. And it's interesting in the code, it's uh, very clear um, that there's clear guidance on one side of the 403B or 457 plan, but there's not very much guidance on the 403B, but we decided to take the high road and, and apply the guidance to both. And so your responsibility is to really set up a structure, um, pick a uh, direction in terms of a menu, because it's the participants who are investing the money, not you in this case. And the, and the participants have to have an adequate set of menu choices I like to think of it as an a la carte menu that they can put a full meal together for their investment plan. And so on uh, IMV 448, you're setting forth the, uh, the guidelines that, that the plan should have uh, a core group of funds that represent all of our traditional asset classes, as well as what we call easy choice options, sort of like glide path options that you see very common today, uh, and then a brokerage window. Um, and then uh, within our structure, there is a, a Pension 2 Advisory Committee that Ed's uh, staff um, chair or teams up and runs. Um, I have an investment officer and myself that participate in that, and we'll make the discrete investment options about which mutual fund to offer within those asset classes and how many to offer. At uh, times, for instance, in the U.S. market, you want to offer a large cap and a small cap, an active and a passive option. Uh, and then the last thing I would point out is uh, on INV 4. Uh, five two, we specify your duties um, as the board within the pension two assets. We make it clear how it is divided up between myself and Ed. Uh, and then in some of the plans, the employers wanted to reserve the right to pick the investment options. So we've had to make a note of that, that in that case, you're not responsible for it, but the employer that picked it was. And then reporting back, we'll, uh, Ed has continually reported to the Benefits and Services Committee what's going on in Pension 2. He'll continue to do that, and then we'll develop some investment reports to make you aware of how the investment options are doing in Pension 2 and just keep you apprised of that. So with that, open to any questions. Can I just ask, when you, went, you were talking about the, um, the different vehicles, I'm trying to find it right now. <clears throat> and you talked about the... Easy choice for, uh, is that kind of like a target date? Yeah, it's a, Those, it's a I'm trying to think date. of the 
term it, for it. It's but a you, target date fund, but what's different about it from more traditional target date funds is not only are you selecting the, the year in which you want to retire, but it's also the level of risk you want to take. So we have an aggressive 2040 fund and a, a conservative one and a moderate one. So and there's kind of three, kind of the smaller there's three risk tolerances in each target, in each target date. Target. Um, let me grab Tom before you start, Ed. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, so I'm uh, a little confused. So what our responsibility is, is, is you're describing it, is to make, is to give oversight to the selection of managers and fund vehicles you uh, select or recommend. Uh, us saying, yes, that's within the reasonable range. We you know, pick, name any manager, we say, yeah, they're, well regarded and have a decent track record is that it or are we supposed to choose between five indexers no we followed the um, same kind of way you operate with a defined benefit plan that you sort of set the vision and the policy but then uh, delegate to staff to execute the actual implementation so the advisory committee and I'll sign off on the actual option which manager mutual fund will pick you've set the guidelines of we want you know equity funds bond funds those and, kind of funds. And we, and we don't set performance <laughs> guidelines, like somebody has to be in the upper quartile. Of well, and as you know, with, as particularly with the mutual funds, they'll ebb and flow within their right. Morningstar rankings and how they're doing. Uh, and we've established, just like we do in the defined benefit plan where we look at our managers, guidelines that over time, if the manager changes, the portfolio managers changes, then we put them on a watch list. If performance deteriorates, we put them on a watch list. But we'll make very slow decisions on when to finally give up on a fund and switch because then you have to notify the participants sometimes you map them into a new fund sometimes you give the option to leave so we're always careful about changing those menu options but we want to pick uh, better performing funds and also ones that are reasonable fees not just the name brand popular ones and so the step we're taking is making sure you have in place a monitoring process Yep, setting up the, the overall structure, describing that you want a, a fair and robust uh, uh, menu of options, and then delegating it to the uh, Pension Advisory Committee to then go out and execute and pick those options and, and monitor and set guidelines. I think what's so unusual here is we're not the employer, so we're actually now in the shoes of essentially being a competing vendor in the market for 403B plans. So even though we're de developing a... a, a uh, a thoughtful, measured, structured investment package. Um, those school districts, because of the laws in California, are entertaining investment options from a myriad of other vendors who may not have that same level of scrutiny and measurement and and um, might bring a different perspective to how those investment options are brought to the market. But normally this would be, you'd expect a more of a 401k structure where everything we're doing, this investment policy, we're from the employer and, and your arms are around that basket of investment options. Um, this is quite different, but we still want to have that same level of um, integrity to the program. So let me interject because I know Paul's waiting in line to speak as well. I, I, I guess I think Tom's question is a good question. It's something I know when I've talked with staff beforehand with this item. You know, that again, our board, we, we provide oversight, and our job is to kind of monitor this, as I understand, and what I read in the in the. I think the question that I would like, and I know, Ed, you'll address this, but I just want to raise it, is... I know that we've had this system, we've had Pension 2 in place for a long time, and so I think the question, a reasonable question for the board to be asking is, so why why now are we talking about a policy in the investment committee about this particular issue when in the past it's kind of been you and benefits and services? And so I think, I think if you could address that question first, that might help lay the foundation, and then I think we've got a couple people in line to ask questions. So. Sure. Um, you know, there's a couple of things. One is, you know, we, the program has evolved and matured over the years that we've had it, where we started out with, with three funds and now we're up to 22 funds and a much more sophisticated process. And, and you know, so we wanted to make sure that there was that there was clear understanding on everyone's part about the, about the way in which the program is administered in terms of who makes a decision around funds you know, what the, what the board's authority is, what the staff's authority is. So there wasn't any question. We've, over the years, it, you know, funds have been selected by different means and it, it wasn't clear, it wasn't, there wasn't a clear process by which those funds get established or get identified. The other thing is, is as, as it's grown, it's now close to about a half a billion dollar uh, program. 
you know, we wanted to provide more visibility to the participants about the program. So on the on the website now, there'll be a lot more information about, you know, what's on the watch list, you know, all, all the funds so that um, you know, there's a lot more transparency about, about how the program operates. So we just felt it was sort of time to to adopt what's considered to be a best practice of having an actual policy statement. And in the prior meeting, you know, we came to the board and said, you know, we think that what's most efficient is to delegate some of the authority to the staff. And the, the board decided that they wanted to do that other than adopting the policy statement itself, which they felt was consistent with their authority under the DB program. So we're just trying to be consistent with the way that the board and the staff interact now with, their, with the primary program. Policies. I love. It. So I think it's great that we're actually adopting it, so that we have something to point to for our members or for anyone to be able to say this is, this is the document that substantiates why we do what we do. And my understanding again is Ed that you're, that you're looking at administrating and managing it, and right. then Chris and investments is looking at the investment options. That's right. the division of labor. Okay. Right. So Paul. Yeah, I have. I have sort of had some of the same questions. Re reading on on INV 452. Uh, I'm again trying to get a little clarity on, as to what what's the board responsibility and staff. It it, mm -hmm. it says um, that second paragraph under duties and responsibilities, mm -hmm. the board's authority. If you go to the second sentence, to that end, the board and staff shall select, monitor, and oversee a diverse menu of of investment options. I assume the board isn't going to be selecting the investments, but we're we're adopting policies. And I guess my question. There is, it then goes on to say, um, investments with aggregate risk and return characteristics in it, in any, at any point within the range appropriate for long-term retirement savings. So who is defining what is a, the range of appropriate, <coughs> appropriate for retirement savings? Is that, is that a policy decision of this board, or, or where does that come from? Okay. That's largely coming from the advisory committee, which has where we have a consultant who's identified in the in the, the write up who works with us to develop the glide path. So they're they're identifying that within each type of asset class in the portfolio, you know how much would be in equity, how much would be in fixed income, how much would be in real estate, and so on. And we show, and we show that glide path. So that's it's that's going to be determined by the advisory committee working with with our financial planning consultant. So the, the board is delegating to the yes. advisory committee to, to make Delegating to the staff, right, delegating to Jack, who's delegating it to the, to, to the to advisory committee, with. right. Okay. Yeah, the, the selection, I mean, in terms of that one particular sentence, the, the board's role in terms of selecting is more selecting the asset classes that are identified on, on uh, page 448, the equity, the fixed income, money market, inflation hedging, real estate, or real asset, and socially responsible. The board identifies that. That can change. Obviously, that you could select different ones, and then we, and then the staff would sort of take it from there. Paul, I would add, and you know I'm not a lawyer, so just for the record, I'm not a lawyer. Um, so I'm going to lean on Brian a little bit. Part of that wording uh, comes, I think, from Brian and the Groom Law Group because it's similar to what we say about uh, we have to operate the way a reasonable person in a like capacity would be, and that it's somewhat analogous to that language that you have on the DB side, this is sort of saying you have to provide options that are what are deemed in the industry suitable for long-term investment options. So, so is that a fair way to describe I, it, Brian? Well, actually, I, I think getting, I hope getting more to Paul's question, this is similar to the investment policies. In other words, the board has responsibility but has delegated part of it, and this is but this language in here reflects the oversight role of the board and to keep staff responsible to the board for these decisions, and that's what the language reflects. And then the general fiduciary standard is, at, uh, is the same as the one that's found in the statute. So it is very similar to the way you do uh, investments through policy as opposed to individual selections. Okay, but then, so what we're doing is, is we're saying to the staff, work with the, the committee and the advisory, the advisory committee, and then then make available to people a range of investments that are reasonable for this purpose. And there are certain investments that might not be reasonable for this purpose because they're too risky, too speculative, whatever. 
but then our responsibility is actually within that range of reasonable mm -hmm. investments to give people a wide variety of investment options to choose from because our responsibility isn't then to pick their investments, but to give them a wide range of opportunity. Okay, thank you. Michael. Um, the, the, the previous question and answers are very helpful, and I guess my one question is, how does the self-directed directed brokerage window fit within that? It's, it's simply just a choice that they're, that it's an option that's available to them. We don't, we make it very clear that we're, we don't in any way endorse the individual investments that are in the window, but it's, it's a fairly common tool that's available in DC plans where, mem you know, a participant can say, you know, I don't like any of these core options. I want to have money in, you know, say the uh, T row price or whatever it is that they want that particular fund, it's available to them. Do we, when I say we, I mean CalSTRS. Do we retain any exposure with respect to that investment well, I, I would defer to Brian, but it's very clear in the material that, that in no way, shape, or form, I mean, in the entire program, it's made very clear that the participant is taking on all the responsibility for selecting options. But in that particular one, we're not even, the CalSTRS is not taking any responsibility for the fund choices that are available. CalSTRS is simply saying, here's 5,000 mutual funds that are provided for the brokerage window. You're completely on your own in terms of what you select. We're not making any judgment about the quality of any of those. Yeah, my, my, my question is really, really directed to Brian, and, and it's, and it's uh, based on uh, similar type structures that, that I've seen in the private sector where, um, and, and this is certainly, this is strictly under the private sector, as I recall, that um, uh, the, the, the trustees of a private pension plan retain fiduciary responsibility even if employees or participants have full unfettered discretion to pick anything they want unless certain very restrictive criteria are met. And, and so merely saying you're on your own isn't sufficient. So I just want to make sure that we have um, vetted that issue careful we have vetted it uh, carefully uh, Michael one of the issues that came up in the drafting of this was whether or not we wanted to specifically uh, add to that language it's on the bottom of page four uh, 449 about the self-directed brokerage window uh, we talked about they're not selected endorsed or monitored and uh, and the issue came up whether we wanted to uh, specifically say to s assume no fiduciary duty. And that was a discussion that was certainly my suggestion and uh, that may need to go into another version of this. Yeah, I, I asked the question with, with uh, no claim of knowledge about the legal standard. <laughs> I'm good. Okay, great. We've got Tom. Oh, um, thanks. Um, my last question on this is what is going to be the process to whereby we'll review this uh, and uh, satisfy the duties that are set out in this policy? What our plan is on the investment committee side is to come back to you annually with an investment report um, on the uh, Pension 2 performance. Um, as Ed said, there's already a menu of 22 options and they have been in place for a while, so we'll be able to, there won't be a delay, we'll be able to come right up to speed with showing you the return of those and then how the participants have allocated their assets. Uh, and I believe, Ed, you already do a report for benefits and services. Correct, and we would normally do those. We, we'd be doing that in November. Normally, you know, in the past, it's included performance uh, information around the core funds. We'll have to sort of figure out what's the best way to sort of divide that and make it more efficient. Um, and, then, and, then the, and then the poly statement itself will come back to the investment committee every year for whatever revisions are appropriate would, would, that the staff would be recommending to the, to okay, the I guess, committee. I guess the other thing that would be of interest would be investment alternatives added and subtracted. Mm -hmm. Changes, modifications. Um, and my understanding, Tom, and, and 
to the committee is that you've brought this to us today as a draft for input, feedback, and that we could move it to an action item and prove it today, or we can ask for it to be brought back to us in November, November and approve. So I, I guess I want to get a sense of, of the, the committee. Are we ready to, can we move it as an action item and approve it today? I'm the comfortable people... with, the, with the current structure. Okay. All right, so I don't know if I've officially just changed it into an action item. Can we yeah. just yeah. do that? Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. so it is now an action item, and let's go ahead and um, we're voting to accept um, well, this I'm, as a policy. So moved. Second. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And I, I did just want to comment to Ed. Um, I, I did mention, you know, there was in the write-up, there was a mention of a consultant that's helping I know working with Ed staff in, and I just said, you know, I have this thing about consultants. I just like to meet them. I like to kind of hear if it doesn't have to be a long presentation, but maybe next time there's a presentation on the pension to program, whenever that is, so no rush, but perhaps he could just come and introduce himself to the board and we can meet him. And Yeah, just to clarify, we, we will be bringing to the benefits and services at the next meeting, the annual report, if you'd like to have him be as part of that, we can certainly arrange that. Okay. And I'm saying five, ten minutes, not a PowerPoint, oh, not a long, but just I yeah. like to kind of meet the folks that sure. we're paying us come to. Well, we'll, we'll try to arrange that. Great. Sure. Okay. All right. Yes. Me. Sorry. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to, to let uh, the committee know that uh, you don't see uh, Ian Lanoff in the in the audience, but right. two of his, two you. of his attorneys, two of the attorneys from Groom Law are in the audience. Uh, David Levine and Julia Zuckerman. Right. And uh, David worked on this policy. So I just wanted you to know, in case someone wants to hear from fiduciary counsel, they are here. Yeah, I, I hear Ian is in Spain or somewhere. I, some, I feel he wanted where, to go there instead of hang out with us in Sacramento. I don't know why. Here if you can <laughs> but I thank you, Brian, for that. I really appreciate it. It's good to have you guys here. Thank you. And with that, we're going to um, finish item, um, what is that, 14? And um, we'll break, and we'll take maybe a 15-minute break or so, um, so that the client advisory can get started. Ed, you're free to lead your meeting now. Oh, and uh, we'll take a 15-minute break, and we'll come back at 20 till 3 and finish up our items. Thanks. Going to our public comments. So I know you know journey today. We're at 15A, and we will also uh, Brian Barto, our, our general counsel, will remind you that we will have another opportunity to take public. We do have some travel concerns, so we want to take time for them to speak. I'm loud enough without it. So, <laughs> um, But I, I did want to, um, I know we've seen um, other colleagues from Unite here. We have Jim Baker here today from Unite here. And um, perhaps, Jim, you can introduce the, the folks that are going to be speaking for us today. Very good. I'm going to actually not say anything, but just directly introduce Victoria and Mireya from the, the Phoenix Hyatt, uh, which is owned by the California Smart Growth Fund, in which the uh, California State Teachers Retirement System is a large uh, limited partner, and which is operated by uh, PCCP LLC, one of the, uh, one of the uh, sort of uh, more significant real estate managers for CalSTRS. Jim, do you mind just commenting about the, the resolution with the National Hyatts, but then the issue. Just, can yeah, just I actually I handed point? it out to folks, uh, to the board members uh, during the break, uh, uh, just a, a short uh, um, press release about the resolution of the dispute uh, between uh, Unite Here and Hyatt. And we're very happy to say that the dispute has been resolved nationally um, in a number of <coughs> properties, and these guys are, are going to talk about it. Uh, you know, it, the issue turns on the, um, you know, the, the specific owner of the property, uh, in the case of the Phoenix Hyatt PCCP, uh, saying that they are supportive of folks having a fair process to organize that the, their employer, Hyatt, has already agreed to. So anyway, that's sort of kind of where we're at is it's, okay. it's uh, these guys will talk about it more, but it's essentially uh, the ball is in PCCP's court. We have a translator as well, Emmanuel Martinez, so thank you. Uh, 
Good afternoon. My name, my name is Victoria Valencia. I work in Enehaya for 15 years. <coughs> um, my name is Victoria Valencia. Uh, he trabajado por 15 años en Enehaya Regency Phoenix como housekeeping. Es la segunda vez que vengo a Sacramento para hablar con ustedes. My name is Victoria Valencia. I work at the Hyatt Regency Phoenix for 15 years in the housekeeping department. This is the second time that I'm here in Sacramento to talk with you all. Hay grandes noticias. La junta del 6 de junio, el 10 de julio, Haya Hotels United Here anunciaron un convenio nacional que resuelve una disputa laboral de varios años. Me emocioné mucho de esa noticia que mis hermanos de otros hayas tendrán un proceso justo. So there is big news since the meeting on uh, July the 6th. Um, so back in uh, July 1st, Hyatt Hotels and Unite Here uh, announced a national agreement uh, that resolves a labor dispute between uh, that's that's been going on for years. I am very excited because I know that my other brothers and sisters in other Hyatt hotels will have the opportunity of a fair process. Desgraciadamente, ese convenio no nos afecta a mí ni mis compañeros del Hyatt Regency Finis, porque Hyatt no es el dueño. El dueño de Hyatt Regents Finis es PCCP. Solo PCCP tiene el poder de mejorar nuestras condiciones de trabajo. Unfortunately, this agreement does not affect me, uh, my coworkers and I at the Hyatt Regency Phoenix because Hyatt is not the owner. The owner of this Hyatt is PCCP and only PCCP has the power to <clears throat> better off the our working conditions. <coughs> El mes pasado, mis compañeros y yo tuvimos la oportunidad de hablar con uh, Bill Lindsay, dueño de PCCP. Él nos dijo que la disputa laboral sería malo para el negocio del hotel y que él quiere hacer dinero y atraer turistas. Nos dijo, si los trabajadores quieren una unión, deberán tener una. So about a month ago, my coworkers and I had the opportunity to, to speak with Mr. Bill, Bill Lindsay, owner of PCCP. He told us that um, uh, the labor dispute is bad for the hotel business, right? And that he wants to make money and bring tourism to the hotel. Also, he told us that if the workers want to bring, uh, want to have a fair price and want to have a union, they should have one. Yo escuché todas las palabras pero PCCP no ha entrado en ningún acuerdo. Si el proceso es aceptable para Hyatt, porque PCC no lo está aceptando. So I heard all these words, <clears throat> but PCCP has not come into an agreement. And if the process is, is acceptable for Hyatt, why PCCP is not accepting it? Cuando regresé al trabajo después de habernos juntado con el señor Lindsay, mi supervisora me preguntó cómo estaba el clima en California. Desde que regresamos de California hace unas semanas, nuestra cuota de cuartos ha subido. La carga de cuartos es difícil de completar en ocho horas de trabajo. So when I came back to work, after uh, having met with uh, Mr. Bill Lindsay, one of my supervisors asked me, how's the weather in California? So also since uh, a couple of weeks ago, since we came back from California, right, the room quota has increased. And this, this workload is just really hard to complete in, a, in, a, in, an, in an eight hour shift. El señor Lindsay nos dijo que él piensa que un hotel donde se trata bien a los empleados es una buena inversión. 
yo no entiendo por qué nuestro, nuestra cuota de cuartos ha incrementado desde que regresamos de California, si ese es el caso. Mr. Lindsay told us that a, a, where a hotel where workers are treated fairly and good, it's, it's a good investment. So that I don't understand why our room quota has increased since we came back from California, if that's the case. El señor Lindsay dijo que quería hablar con sus inversionistas antes de hacer una decisión. Sabemos que Casters es el inversionista más importante para PCCP, por eso estamos aquí. Les pedimos que le digan a PCCP que está de acuerdo que los inversionistas son mejores cuando se tratan bien a los trabajadores, que una pelea laboral es malo para el negocio y que si los trabajadores quieren la unión, la deberían aceptar. Mr. Lindsay told us that he uh, wanted to speak with um, the investors before making a decision. Now, I know that Calsters is the, one of the most important investors for PCCP, and that's why we're here. So I asked that you tell PCCP to, you know, to come to an agreement that the best investments are when workers are treated fairly and that a labor dispute is bad for business. And if the workers want to have a fair process in a union, they should have one. Muchísimas gracias a todos por su atención. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Victoria. And then I believe we have Maria. Maria Mariscal. <clears throat> good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Good. Okay. Good afternoon, Chairman and Committee. My name is Maria Mariscal. I'm a banquet server at Hyatt Regency Phoenix. I have worked for Hyatt Hotel for six years. The sec this is the second time I have traveled to Sacramento to testify before you about, fi about Hyatt Regency Phoenix. There has been a huge development since last time I was here, uh, here on June 6. About a month later on July 1st, Hyatt Hotels and Unite Here announced the national agreement to resolve a long-standing labor. Unfortunately, this historic agreement does not apply to me and my coworkers at the Hyatt Regency Phoenix because it's owned by it's not owned by Hyatt. The Hyatt Regency Phoenix is owned by PCCP. Only PCCP has the power to improve our working conditions at the hotel. Last time I was here, I told you I told you I could not afford to purchase health insurance offered by the hotel. Even though, I'm a, even though I'm a professional server, I have no choice but to apply for state Medicare. We deserve better. I know that Callisters is the most important investors to PCCP. Please tell PCCP to agree to fair process at the Hyatt Regency Phoenix. If a fair process is good enough for Hyatt, why isn't good enough for PCCP? Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Mariscal and Ms. Valencia and um, Mr. Martinez for, for coming and uh, Mr. Baker from Unite Here. Um, Chris will direct staff to follow up on, on the, the request and report back to the board. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right. Um, we are going to head back on our tour today. We're going back to item 8. So... This is a chance to uh, update the investment policy, uh, which is our overriding. This is the big document that drives uh, the defined benefit assets. Um, we're going to update it for the asset allocation you approved, the implementation you, plan you approve, as well as pick up uh, some other uh, procedural changes. For instance, all of the benchmarks were uh, adjusted to reflect the, that they're X uh, firearms. We realize that they're ex uh, just firearms banned in the state of California, but that worked out to too long of a title, so we said firearms, and we'll note that in the appendix. Um, and then another global change we'd request that you would uh, consider making 
Um, I want to credit Frank Moore. He picked up a few uh, typos and, and errors we had made where we referred to cash instead of liquidity um, and where we had some typos in the back uh, end. But also, um, we've had some discussions at the last meeting about ESG. So this would be page 130, INV 136. Uh, it is not noted as a, a global change, but I ask that you consider it today. Um, ESG, uh, when we started it, we called it uh, environmental, social, and geopolitical because we were dealing with Iran and Sudan at the time. Uh, but now it certainly has become known in the industry as uh, environmental, social, and governance. So we would like to make the global change that anywhere where we spell out ESG, we drop the word, replace the word geopolitical with the word governance. And then I guess our last request would be, if you're willing to approve it today, um, we would like to make it effective uh, for this fiscal year so that the performance measurement of the asset allocation would pick up back to, uh, would start on July 1st. It helps when it comes to not only your performance with PCA, but also your incentive compensation. Um, it is basically where the asset allocation was at the time, so it's not a significant um, move. Um, and then if you're willing in the past, what we had done is once you had approved it, you had delegated to the chair of the investment committee the ability since uh, uh, Sharon is a good proofreader to help clean up any edits that we may have missed or anybody might have missed in the, in the editing before we go absolutely final. So she would have the final review to say it's uh, ready to go. And open for comments or questions. On this item? Does everyone want to met up? Oh, go ahead, Tom. Do you want to just chime in there, Tom? No, I was going to say I'm comfortable just mo moving it. And you're okay with the change, the governance? That was me if you didn't figure out the governance um, issue. So the universal change from geopolitical to governance, and I'll just take a look at it from with staff. Great. Any other comments? I'm ready to move. Is it an action item? So all those in favor say aye. 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 Do we have a second? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll no second. second. You got that, Lamont? Okay. Right. Have a second. Yeah, all those in favor say aye. Aye. <laughs> Opposed? Any abstentions? Great. Excellent. Thanks. That's Thank approved, you. Chris. All right. Item number nine, Michelle, asset class policy revisions. All right, good afternoon. Um, for those, the newer members, I'll introduce myself. I'm Michelle Cunningham. I'm the acting deputy chief investment officer. And uh, so the item before you, I'll follow in Chris's footsteps. I'll make this nice and short. Um, this is the second reading of a policy that uh, I brought to you in July. It is um, bringing some standardized language into the asset class policies having to do with the environmental, social, and governance risks. Um, at the time in July, you didn't have any changes to the actual standardized language that we were proposing, but you did have some other standardized um, suggestions that you wanted in the, uh, the policies, the different asset class policies. And so I worked with legal and some of the other areas in terms of who is the actual um, uh, governing body, and it is the board. So I included that in the uh, policies. And then the uh, treasurer's office had a good suggestion. Um, if I can refer you to page INV 150, the, um, the global equity portfolio policy, the last paragraph in the executive summary, uh, it's the first sentence, as with all other plan assets, these policies cannot be altered without explicit direction from the board. I'd like to suggest that maybe we include that in each of the policies. Uh, I, just I just found the page. So I'm sorry. You're saying INV 150? Yes. And INV sorry, so 150, it's uh -huh. the last paragraph in the executive summary, okay. the first sentence. Um, it's in a couple of the policies that, as with all other plan assets, these policies cannot be altered without explicit direction from the board. I'd like to um, follow the treasurer's recommendation, include that in all the policies. Um, 
and uh, of course do the global change for governance and if uh, I can either bring that back, bring this back for a third reading, or if you adopt it today, um, perhaps have you review it, uh, and then we'll we'll put it into place. I'm going to both go here. Let's go. Let me get to Tom. Did you click on one? I don't see. It. Oh, there we go. Go ahead. Well, I'm I'm comfortable moving this at this point. So the. The, to, to move it ahead, and then I'll, I'll take a look at the edits along with the document that Chris talked about. Second. Thank you. Okay, I got the second now. Right. So all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstentions? Great. It is approved. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Michelle. All right. Next one too. I was going to say, I believe we're on item 13 now. <laughs> So, Michelle, an update on it. our internal external yeah. asset management. And I, I have a, a couple of folks joining me, and, and we don't have a long presentation since we are item 13 of 21. I just wanted to introduce a couple of the staff um, to you that have been very involved in uh, implementing some of the internal strategies. And so I will start with, with my left, and you're going to hear a theme as I introduce the staff. This is David Murphy, the Acting Director of Global Equities. I have Paul Shantick, the Acting Co-Director of Fixed Income, and Glenn Hosakawa at the end, the, acting, the other Acting Co-Director of Fixed Income. We had a couple retirements in the last year or so, and so there's, uh, um, this is the team that's taken over the fixed income and equities uh, portfolios. And so basically, this is an information item. We just wanted to close the loop on some research that was done a, a couple years ago, uh, actually this, probably this month or so. And the research was done to, do, to look into uh, what peers, what our peer groups were doing in terms of internal management. And so we looked at not only large public plans in the US, but also globally. And so from that research, we uh, came up with what we felt was uh, not only best practices, but what was really a good framework for CalSTRS. And we worked with PCA on that and came up with the, uh, the matrix that is in the attachment to the, uh, the item 13 that you have in front of you. And so once we did the research and developed the framework, then we applied that across the portfolio to any new and existing uh, strategies that we thought fit. And so after making the presentations to you, we uh, came up with a, a series of recommendations and you, you approved that we go ahead and move forward on several of those strategies. And so what we uh, have provided you in your attachment or your uh, item today is just an update on the three strategies that we were able to implement. And so um, I guess the most important thing um, that we'd like to leave you with today is that going forward, if we have the resources and the budget, we will continue to use the matrix that we prepared and go forward with those, those strategies. And where you'll see that is in the ongoing reporting. In fact, you could, you've already, uh, in the semi-annual reporting for the investment managers, you will have seen the performance and the activities of these strategies already. Um, and then you'll see them uh, in the uh, quarterly reporting that we do. Uh, if we don't have the budgets, the budget or the resources, we will definitely come back to you. And, um, and I guess I'll just leave it with that and leave it to any questions you might have. Uh, and I, I might say, David, of course, was responsible for the internal global equity strategy, Paul, the high yield strategy, and Glenn, the currency strategy, if you have any particular questions. With that. Are there any questions from the committee? I think, oh, go ahead, Chris. You have a question? I'll, I'll, I'll answer right. your question first. Because I know that uh, I had a discussion with a board member on this. So, uh, David, um, INV 434, I didn't prepare them for this. It says uh, the internal cost is zero. And then uh, uh, Glenn on uh, 436, it also says the internal cost is zero. How could we run money for free? How could that possibly be true? You know, it probably should have been additional 
um, internal management costs? Because answer to that. We, we have the existing resources to run these strategies, so that's the reason why it was zero cost. It should have just been additional cost. So there's a cost of repaying people's salaries. Right. Like it's an existing cost an that we already had. Uh, so when we consider the budget request tomorrow for some additional <laughs> investment <laughs> staff <laughs> positions <laughs> to run money internally, uh, <laughs> <laughs> why, why, why? Yeah. <laughs> explain the difference. Paul like zero. <laughs> and I'm sure you've seen it in the write-up. We haven't had any new investment positions for a couple years now. And so a lot of those positions are to catch us up from the last couple years and for additional internal management. Um, and I should probably let you speak up, but um, in global equities, you know, to move us forward toward more internal management, specifically in the global equity portfolio. Do you want to? And, and specifically, and I mentioned it in the quarterly video, that we want to bring in uh, non-US passive in-house. And that would require additional resources. I would in the future. Because it would be a, a new It's a completely new strategy. New right strategy now we're just ru running a Russell 3000, which is a US right. strategy. This would be bringing in non-US, which would be 23 different countries and some odd currencies. So it would be a different effort, and we'd probably need additional resources for that So to endeavor. increase the amount of money we manage internally Correct. in a Russell 3000 strategy doesn't necessarily require more people. It just requires every time we make an investment to make a larger investment. But it's the same investment, the same amount of effort to. Right. OK. Yep. And I, just to give the bit, this board a bigger picture, because I can see a lot of you weren't here when we first did this in, in 09. We looked at internal versus external management, realized we were at about uh, only about a third of the assets. And what you have to realize is because the investment office is only about 30 years old here. We were born out of PERS and started 100% external. Um, and so it's been a slow move to bring assets back in-house. When we looked at our global peers, we found that they averaged between 50 to 60% internal and had, lower, had more cost savings because of that. So we've been a process of running fixed income internally for about two decades now. And, and a little bit of the U.S. passive. And we came to you with a plan, that matrix Michelle just said, you approved. We had uh, step one, step two, and step three. Step one was we can do this within our existing capacity, no added cost. And that's why you see this. <laughs> step two was we'll probably need additional resources in terms of software, equipment, things like that. But then step three is we'll need people. And we realize here in our budget, that's much more of an intense request. So you told us to implement all of step one and start moving on step two, which is our report back. It took us longer than we thought to get all of step one done, but we've done it. Now what you'll see is our budget request tomorrow, which is to help us get into step two and then even some of the steps three strategies where we would be able to terminate or pull money almost away. What, what Alan recommended is don't pull all the money away from the external manager. Keep some there as a backup, but you could move you know 90% of the money in-house, and that's where you see our cost savings. We think we'll see even more cost savings in some of these strategies, because a couple of them would actually be new, or we'd be hiring a manager at today's prices versus paying internal staff. Um, and so you'll see that in our justification on all the things where we're looking for internal assets that we think we can run competitively with the outside. There are obviously things, as the matrix shows, we just we can't do internally with state employees and, and wouldn't try to. So we hire external managers and pay them a higher fee. Any other questions from committee members? Great. All right. Thanks, and Thanks, Michelle. Oh. Tom. I just want to say I, I, I really encourage the internalization of management whenever it's possible and, and cost effective. Um, and encourage you to think of other asset categories to do the same. Thanks, Tom. Great. All right, we are at item 15. Review of information requests. Do we have any? Lamont? 
All right, seeing none. Uh, item 16 is a draft agenda for our November investment committee meeting. If everyone can take a look at that, it's an informational item. I will. Um, is there anything we need to add to that? Sharon, yeah, I will coordinate with Ed. If he's doing the pension to um, report for benefits okay. and services, we'll see what we can just uh, break out from that and bring it to you for the investment side so you can at least get a glimpse, because not all of you are on benefits and services. Right. And then we'll see what, what more we should enhance, because uh, that'd be the first time you'd see that kind of report. But I, I would highlight uh, number eight on that. Uh, we really, if, when I realized we have two new board members in June, we had a very robust, um, healthy discussion about active passive management. We had a panel discussion with uh, a full active manager, enhanced manager, a passive, and a diversity manager. And I thought it really was helpful. We've had a break because unfortunately, our staff person that led that discussion um, was killed in a bicycling accident. Um, so we didn't want to burden their workload in the summer. We gave them a break for this month, but we'll be back in um, November with a continuation of that discussion shooting to a policy recommendation. So that's the big fall project you had uh, proposed that we do. Any questions about the agenda? And let's move to 16A, which is our opportunities for statement of the public. Is there any more statements from the public? Seeing none, we are going to adjourn from open session and go into closed session. So if you are not a CalSTRS staff member or board member, have a good rest of your day. And we'll see you tomorrow if you're coming back.